Good evening. Praise God. This is Pastor CE. I'm so glad to be with you. Sorry, we're about four minutes late. We had a little technical difficulty there right before it was time to go live. You know, the enemy's always busy, but God is bigger than that. Amen. So I'm so glad I get to come to you tonight and share some things with you and and share some uh, scriptures and uh, encouragement that the Lord has been speaking to me about. And I just thank God for this opportunity. Um, I'm in my office at work. It was just a quiet place to to be and to, uh, you know, meditate over the word tonight. So I, I hope that you are blessed tonight by something that is shared. And I just pray right now. Let's, let's pray. Father, we just come before you right now. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we can just come boldly before your throne, that we can just share our hearts with you, Father, and that we can open up our minds and hearts that we can receive from you, Father. We just You said in your word that if we would draw nigh to you, you'd draw nigh to us. And Father, as we take this next hour to just draw nigh to you and to get closer with you, Father, that you would just encourage our hearts. Give us what you would have us to say. Help us to hear. Help us to receive what you have for us tonight, Lord. We just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm so thankful tonight to be uh, with you on the airways, so to speak, um, and to have this opportunity to, to, to share the word. God has really been speaking to me lately about, uh, you know, not getting stuck in a place of condemnation when we feel like we've let God down or we feel like we've, we've, you know, not moved quick enough, or maybe we went too far, maybe we went too far in a direction, or we, we didn't allow uh, the Lord to work in us what it is He had for us to do, and, and we've maybe sinned, you know, or we've procrastinated, or we just weren't in the right place at the right time, and so it's real easy, and the enemy would like us to get stuck in a place of complacency and there's no point in going forward there's no point in trying anymore um, if you've never had that emotion just keep living you know does it you know that happens in all areas of our life sometimes we get on our jobs and we get in a rut or we we're in our getting our education or whatever we're doing we can get in those conditions where we start feeling like you know what's the point? Why keep going? Why keep, I, I can't I can't do what I set out to do anyway. You know what I, what was on my heart ten years ago? I can't do it now. I, you know that I'm I'm too old or I've gone too far. I, I mean, that, we have these kinds of 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 moments where we just have no point in going forward. We apologize for the that are coming through right now. Um, I planned to use my laptop, but it wasn't cooperating. But anyway, I thank God. His word declares, and uh, where I want to come from tonight is in the book of Philippians, uh, the first chapter in the sixth verse. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in us, you and me, is faithful. Amen. He, he, he will. He's, I'm going to read the scripture again. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, we sing a song about that. It says he's faithful to complete it, and I believe that, you know. But he is. He he don't give up. See, he knows more than we know. He, he knows down the road from where we are. He can see we're just right there. Sometimes we're just around the corner from the breakthrough. We're just, you know, 10 steps from the overflow. Sometimes we're closer than we realize. And it, it, the enemy would like, to, like us to think there's no point in going on. There's no point in keep continuing this whole thing because I'm tired. I'm worried out. I'm exhausted. I'm discouraged. I don't feel like going on anymore. There's no point. God's not even hearing my prayers. All those things come against us. All those things war against us. All those things that we, excuse me, we deal with are not what God has for us, but they're the, the plan that the enemy has for us. And he's so quick to talk to us in a moment. He's so quick to keep his words fresh in our mind. And we just keep if we're not watchful, we'll start meditating on those things. And after a while, we're defeated. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We have to go back to the fact that he said he has confidence here. Paul was writing the book of Philippians. He said in the church of Philippi, he said, I am confident, confident that he who began this good work in you will perform it. 
He who started it, he's going to finish it. God's not giving up on you. God's not giving up on me. You might think, well, I have this weakness or I have this struggle. Paul had struggles. He wrote about it. He said, when I would do good, evil was ever When I would do good, evil was always right there. It just seemed like, oh my goodness, I want to do right, but temptation comes. I want to do right, but somebody's attitude comes along. I want to do this, but here's an opinion. We, we, we put so much weight on people's opinions and what they're saying to us and what people think that we forget to think, okay, now God told me this. God showed this to me. This is my vision. This is the thing that God laid on my heart, and he gave it to me, and who he calls, he qualifies. So if he gave it to me, then I need to keep moving. It doesn't matter if this person don't understand. A lot of people are not going to understand what God has put in you. Now, there shouldn't be everybody's against you. There should be people that can see. I can see what God is doing in you. And you should have endeavor to surround yourself with people that will build you up and that will speak to you and will speak into you and pour into you and encourage you. Obey God. Obey God. You can do this. You can make it. But you're still going to have people around you that are going to have opinions. People that are close to you. People that are related to you. People that are have been connected since, you know, way back. They back in the day, we've been, you know, like this. We've been connected. We're, you know, this is my this is my person, you know. Sometimes you have to just accept the fact that they're not going to understand where you're trying to go. Amen. But we got to we got to stop letting the enemy beat us up, and we've got to stop beating ourselves up because we've taken this long to start moving in a direction or we've taken too long or we we backed up from something we got hurt so we backed up or we got disappointed so we backed up and maybe we didn't back up maybe we just stopped you know you don't have to back up to stop progress you can be sitting still you know i you know when you're sitting at a stoplight you're sitting there you're not you haven't stopped your car hasn't stopped but you stopped progressing but when you start anticipating, I don't know about you or anybody else, but when I'm sitting at a red light and I'm really ready to go, I start looking at the other lights to see, have they turned yellow yet? Oh, that one's yellow. Okay, I'm getting ready to go. And, so I'm getting, and I might start inching forward. When you start uh, anticipating, when you start anticipating an increase, you start anticipating a going forward, you start moving forward. You're thinking about where I'm going. You're thinking about where I'm going to end up. You're thinking about the, the end result, whether you know, you're trying to go home and lay down or you're trying to get to the restaurant or you're trying to get to church or you're trying to go pick up somebody. You're right there and you are ready to go. You're, come on, turn green. When you get excited about where you're going, I'm ready to go. Amen? So we need to understand that God is not sitting up there with us. I'm through with you. I'm done with you. You took too long. You 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 just didn't do what I told you to do when you told him to do it. And, and it may delay some things, but God is able. God is able. God has been speaking to me about this the last several weeks about how he can redeem the time. He can redeem the time. You know, if you're near somebody right now and they may not understand, just tell them, God's going to redeem my time. Amen. So I was, I was, I'm looking in the book of Jonah and we talk about Jonah a lot. Over the years, you know, when I learned about Jonah in Sunday school, I heard him preached about, all I ever heard about was Jonah's rebellion. Jonah rebelled. Jonah was a rebellious prophet. Jonah went the other way. Jonah got in trouble. Jonah ended up in the whale. Jonah did this. And Jonah, you know, we talk about the bad of what Jonah did. And it was bad. But what the Lord has just really been showing me and, and really bringing back to my remembrance is in the book of Jonah in the third chapter. <clears throat> I'm sorry. In the... Uh, First chapter, we find where Jonah went the wrong way. He went the opposite of what God told him. And I know none of us have ever gone the opposite of what God told us to do. You know, we, we, we try to do right all the time. But if you've ever gone the opposite direction, it's not fun when you get there. You start going that direction and things start going backwards and crazy. And it's not, this is not flowing. This is not going. This is not doing, Lord. And it takes sometimes a whole real act of God to turn us around. Well, this is where we find Jonah. Jonah was on the ship and, they, and he was asleep and the great storm had come and, and the wrath of God was in operation and they woke him up and said, how, you know, you're asleep and they, they did all these things and they cast lots and and they, it fell on him and they kept, you know, and, and while they're on the, you see in there where all of the sailors on this boat are making sacrifices to their gods and worshiping their God and calling on their God. But it says in the 15th verse of the first chapter, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. Now he's in the ocean. He's in the sea. It's in the next verse says, then the men feared the Lord. All the men on the boat who had been sacrificing to their own gods feared the Lord exceedingly 
and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Suddenly, everybody on that ship was worshiping God, making vows to the true living God, forgot about the God that they were calling on that wasn't doing nothing. They found this God who stopped the sea from raging because of the word of the rebellious prophet. Now they're all making vows to God. So in his rebellion, God still used him. God still used him. And then we read on where Jonah ended up in the whale and he was in there three days and three nights and he you know, went through all that he went through and, and I'm sure it was horrible and he finally repented and the whale threw him up on the, on the ground and he started going towards Nineveh. See, the word of God hadn't changed. His command to Jonah hadn't changed. What he told Jonah to do in the first place hadn't changed. Jonah just went off on a detour. Jonah went over here to try to get away from the Bible says he ran from the presence of God. That's serious. There's a lot of people in that condition where they have ran from the presence of God. But I'm so thankful that he doesn't allow us to run any farther than he can reach because he can reach us. Amen. But in his rebellion, God saved a whole shipload of sailors. And then the, 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 the whale uh, spit him up. Now, don't come for me because I said whale. Jesus called it a whale in the 12th chapter of John, so whatever. But it was a fish that God had prepared. Amen. So he spit him up. And the Bible says in the third chapter, it says now uh, that Nineveh, in the third verse, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city and three days journey. It was a three day journey from where Jonah was to Nineveh. And then the fourth verse says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. Jonah made a three-day journey in one day. God redeemed the time. So he was a rebellious prophet who went the wrong way, did the things he wasn't supposed to do, running from the presence of God. In spite of what he decided to do, God turned it around and used it to save a whole boatload of people who now are serving God. Then he said, Jonah, my hand is on you. You're going to make a one, three-day journey in one day. And he ran into the city in one day. God redeemed the time. So don't count yourself out. Don't sit tonight wherever you are and feel like I can't do anything for God. I can't achieve what God showed me when I was a, a younger person. I can't do that. It's, I'm old. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm down and I'm out. Don't, don't, don't count yourself out. Because Jonah ran into that city and he cried and he said, yea, in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. He preached out that city. We know the rest of the story. The city repented. God didn't destroy him. Jonah still got mad. God had to deal with him and his attitude. So even though Jonah did what he was supposed to do, ultimately God still had to deal with him. Amen. So you might be trying to obey God and do what's right and you may see some blessings and your attitude may still be a little off. But God didn't kill Jonah. God just dealt with him. God kept speaking to him. God kept using him. Amen. So don't get stuck back here. I made a mistake. I can't do anything for God. I'm not worthy. That's the place the enemy likes to stick us. You messed up. You, you procrastinated. You sinned. You went backwards. You went opposite what God said. So you're not worthy. Lying devil. God can turn it around. The Bible says what he meant, what the enemy sent for evil, God will turn it for our good. Amen. God can turn things around and make them beautiful. God spoke to me one time a long time ago. He said, I can unscramble eggs. And I, I you know, I've, I've thought about that a lot. That's serious. God can turn things around and make it look like nothing bad happened. He can, he can restore. He can rejuvenate. He can refresh. He can, he can absolutely heal the broken places. That's why more people need to talk. You know, there's a real push right now for therapy. Everybody needs to get in therapy. And ain't nothing wrong with, with getting some help talking to somebody and getting these things talked out, the trauma that, we, that we've been through or whatever we face. Talk about those things. You know, that that because a, a lot of the behaviors that uh, are going on uh, in people are, are a direct reaction of what they went through and, and they're hurting and they're dealing. And so the, I'm, I'm, I'm very strong on that scripture. I read it constantly where it says, confess your faults one to another and then pray that you be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. God wants to heal the broken places. God wants to heal the places where we have just just been damaged and he wants to heal and and and, and bring it so that it's not something I can't talk about it. We can absolutely talk about it.
talk about. It's something we absolutely can bring to the surface and help somebody else. Amen. We need to be uh, healed. We don't need to act like I never had a problem and I never went through nothing and I never rebelled and I never made a mistake. We don't that that doesn't help nobody. What helps people is when we're transparent enough to say I was a mess and God fixed me. I was an outcast and God rescued me. I was a horrible sinner, but God cleaned me up. Whatever the testimony is, we need to be transparent enough with people to say, hey, I went through this. One of the greatest things I remember uh, in, in my relationship and working with Mother Tucker over the years is anything I brought to her. It didn't matter what it was. I'd come to her and I'd say, you know, before I, before I got married, I said, Mother, uh, this, that, and then after I got married, Grandma, I'd, however I was, you know, talking to her, I was like, hey, uh, I'm having a struggle with this. And every time, I can't think of a time that I didn't bring something that I was personally dealing with to her that she didn't say, well, you know, when I was going through that, this is how I dealt with it. She never made me feel like you are a low down, dirty dog. And yeah, I never had that problem. She was transparent. She was honest with what God had brought her out. In fact, about it, she was proud of what God had brought her out of. She wasn't proud of what she had done, but she was bragging on the power of God. Look what he brought me from. Look how he brought me out. Amen. And that's where we need to be. We don't need to be ashamed of what we came out of. We need to be boasting about the goodness of God and what he brought me out of. And you might have counted me out. You might have counted me as nothing, but God never gave up. Hallelujah. God never gave up on me. God never gave. And he hasn't given up on you. Amen. He has not given up on you. He's able to fulfill everything he promises. We started out in Philippians says, he who began this good work, I'm confident he's going to finish it. He's going to, you are going to finish what God has ordained for you to do. It may not look like what you think it's going to look like. It may not feel like what you think it's going to feel like. It may not come through who you want it to come through. It may not happen the way you want it to happen or on the date you want it to happen. But I promise you, God is working where you can't see. God is opening up doors that no man can close. And thank God he's closing doors that nobody can open back up. God is working and moving by his spirit for his glory. Amen. The Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen. It's by his spirit. I'm, I'm so glad he put in there. He says, not by works, lest any man should boast. It's not by all the stuff that we think we can do, talents and gifts and, and abilities. It's not by those things. Because if it was, then I, well, I could say, well, look what I did. Look what I did. Look what I know. When we were honest about it, look what God is doing. Look what God did. Look what God had his hand all in. I was praying about some stuff one time that was going on, and, and, and I, I was praying about it. I was like, Lord, we need you to fix this. Lord, we need you to deal with this. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clear. He said, I'm going to fix all of this so nobody can get the glory but me. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I called my pastor. And I said, Mother, I said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me about and I named the situation and I said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, he's going to fix all of this so that nobody gets the glory but him. And I tell you, saints, I promise you, I'm a man of my word right now. I'm telling you that I saw God move mountain after mountain, shut mouth after mouth, tear down every stronghold. I've seen things, just miracles just happening, just happening like that. God fixed it and all those things that we were praying about in that moment. It's been some years, but all those things that we were praying out in those situations, God fixed it and can't, if we talk about it today, can't nobody get the glory but God. Because I couldn't have do nothing about it. Mother couldn't do nothing about it. People in the church couldn't do nothing about it. People down the street couldn't do nothing about it. But God, God gets the glory. He gets the glory out of you being a success. He gets the glory out of you being delivered. He gets the glory out of you fulfilling your destiny. He gets the glory. Hallelujah. You praying for people? That's for the glory of God. You witnessing to somebody? That's for the glory of God. You cleaning somebody's house that's sick? That's for the glory of God. You're doing everything you're doing is unto the Lord, not as unto me or as unto yourself. Amen. You're doing as unto the Lord. And he said, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. We've got to remember that we are ministering to mankind, but we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. And when we're ministering to them, we're ministering to him. Hallelujah. He doesn't need the stuff I got, but he needs me to use what he's given me so that I can be a blessing to somebody else. And don't, don't sit tonight. Don't let another day go by. Another moment go by that you 
you sit and think, I can't, I'm not worthy. I don't, God can't use me. God wants to, your mother preached a message one time. She said, God, but why do you wash your cooking vessels? That's what she called them. Why, hallelujah. Why you wash your cooking pots? And, you know, why you wash them? So you can use them again. She said, God wants to clean some of y'all up so he can use you again. You may be feeling like one of them pots that was left on the sink by a trifling teenager that oh, I'm letting them soak. You might be one of them soaking pots, but I promise you, when God gets a hold of you, he'll scrape out whatever needs to be scraped out and get out of there whatever needs to be out so that you can be set on the stove again to be used again for the glory of God. You may not be pretty on the outside. I may be scarred on the outside, but some of the best pots to cook in are the ones that are not pretty. Amen. The best food come out of some of the most damaged pots because they're seasoned. They know what they're doing and they and you ain't got to worry about it. I, come on, I'm a cook. I know what I'm talking about. There's certain things when I want to cook certain stuff, I go for certain pots because I know they can handle what I'm getting ready to do. Amen. I don't, amen. So we won't get into that, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And there's something you want to cook. There's certain things you, certain pot you go after, a certain pan you go after because you know how it's going to act. You know how it's going to react to the heat. You know how it's going to, how it's going to cause your food to react. So you want something good. So sometimes it's the ugliest pot in the kitchen, but it turns out the best food. Amen. So you might feel like the ugliest pot in God's collection, but he's going to turn out some good food out of you. Amen. He's going to bring some results out of you. Hallelujah. He's going to bring some things out of you that you didn't even know were there. Praise God. He's going to cause things to come out out of your mouth that you, oh, you knew that was God because I had never thought about that. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm hearing the words the same time the person is, the congregation is hearing it because it's hitting me and it's hitting the congregation. It's coming to me and then to them. Amen. It's coming through me. Praise God. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that's good. I'll go back and listen to the message sometimes. Say, wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Not because I said it, but because he said it through me. It blesses me. Amen. Because I need the same help that other people need. Praise God. The enemy wants all of us to stop. He wants all of us to sit down and to fold our hands and say, I can't do it anymore. I'm to this. I'm to that. Whatever, whatever package the enemy has tried to sell you, I encourage you tonight. If he's delivered it to your door, stamp on it, return to sender, and let it just go back to where it came from. We're not, we are not what the devil said we are. We are not what the devil claims for us to be. Amen. We are not where the enemy says we're stuck. I say this often to teenagers when I'm ministering to youth. I'm like, look at your neighbor and tell them, tell them you're not stuck. One of the greatest tools that the devil uses for our young people is to get them feeling hopeless. I'll never grow up. I'll never be anything. I'll never be able to please anybody. I'll never reach my goal. I'll never reach my dreams. Listen, the Bible says in the 37th chapter of Psalms, it says, if you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, I read that growing up as he's going to give me stuff that I want if I'm really obeying him. But what that really means is when I delight in him, he'll give me desires that my desires will begin to change. Amen. I preached this a few weeks ago that the, the desires that I had when I was 16 years old and the desires I have at, the, at 50 years old are not the same desires. The goals that I had then are not the same goals I have now. My tastes have changed. My desires have changed because I've spent time with the Father. I spent time in His presence and I and the things that seem like they, oh, I just got to have this. I don't care about that stuff anymore. He gives you the desires of your heart. He changes the desires of your heart. Your appetites change when you start detoxing from all the toxicity of the enemy. And when you, you know, if you, in the natural, if you want to if you want to detox your system, you stop eating sugar and refined sugars and you start feeling different in your body because you're getting all that out of your system. Hey Amen. We need to detox all some, some stuff out of our spirit that we've been holding on to and out of our minds and emotions. We need to let God clean us up so that he can use us. Amen. So that he can work in us. Praise God. You may not ever stand, and I may not ever stand on a major platform and preach to thousands of people at one time. And I may not, you know, but I'm not here to compare myself to anybody. And you shouldn't be comparing yourself to anybody either. Don't sit tonight saying, I'll never be like Mother Tucker. I'll never be like Pastor C.E. I'll never be like Pastor Regina. I'll never be like Bishop Roy. I'll never be like Joyce Meyer. I'll never. God didn't call you to be any of those people. He called you to be you. Praise God. He called you to operate the way he's given you to operate according to his word. Amen. According to his word. When I say be you according to you, I mean, you know, lining up with the word, but be you. You don't. I'm not trying to be somebody else. That's exhausting. But when I'm just myself and I let the word talk to me and then I speak what God is showing me and I go and I minister to people or I go and share something with somebody and I see the results of that. 
That's worth more than gold. That's worth more than money. Is being obedient, being in the will of God, being where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there, trusting that God has begun a work in me, that he's going to finish this work in me, that I'm going to be who he called me to be, and I'm going to go where he told me to go. And when it's all over, if the Lord tarries and I go the way of the grave, amen, then people will be able to say he served God. He touched my life. He was the he was the voice of Jesus in my life. He was the you know because we say it all the time. Sometimes we are the only Bible some people will ever read. They may not ever pick up their Bible and read it, but they're looking at us. And if we're demonstrating the Bible, it can touch lives. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I'm I'm encouraged tonight that we don't need to get bogged down in all the condemnation. That the enemy likes to sit on us. He's such a mean devil. He just, you know, he trick us. He's 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 tricky. He 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 lies to us. He deceives. He does all these things. And one writer in the Bible said, "I wouldn't have you ignorant concerning the devices of Satan. He's got a lot of devices. He's got a lot of ways that he can do stuff. He's got a lot of ways that he can hinder us from going where God wants us to go. I, you know, I can be doing stuff." And just, you know, how you doing, everybody? And, and as soon as it's time to go do something, oh, I don't know. How, what are they going to think about me? I don't know. And you start feeling this anxiety. What is that? I've been singing and playing and preaching for years. Why should I be having anxiety walking into a place? I don't know if these people are going to receive. So what? Amen. I got to obey God. I got to go this place. And when I start feeling, I was like, Lord, you sent me here. And I believe you're going to do the work. A lot of this anxiety that the church world is feeling right now, ministers are feeling, is that we have, as a whole, now I'm not now I'm not talking about everybody, but as a whole, the church world has gotten into this this place where we're trying to manufacture an experience with God. I preached about this a couple of weeks ago, and it really bears repeating. We don't need to try to manufacture a, a, a move of God. We need to allow God to move. Amen. We need to allow God to touch lives and to reach lives and to change lives, not because we cultivated an atmosphere, uh, uh, a man-made thing. No, listen, don't misunderstand me. I go to a lot of worship nights and, and I get invited to a lot of places. And these, I go to these places and they've got all this atmosphere and, and they've got all this, you know, sometimes it's dark and smoke machines are coming out, you know, and they're singing and they're doing all this stuff. And, and I, I'm, I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, Lord, what are we doing here? I'm not saying those things are wrong, that it's wrong to have, you know, a, a venue and to have the things set up looking a certain way and a certain feel that you want. But in the end, where lives changed, where lives impacted, did you really allow the Holy Spirit? You know, because I, I know I know places where I've gone and, you know, they're just so intense and so intent on we got to do this, we got to do this until they program out the presence of God. And then by the end of it, they don't know if anybody got anything. The people are looking around at each other. Was that a real experience with God? Did they have a real encounter with the presence of God? Because when you have a real encounter with the presence of God, whether you're in the belly of the fish like Jonah was, or you're sitting in a 5,000 member church, if you have a real encounter with God, you're going to be changed. I'm going to be changed. Amen. There should be a change when you really encounter the presence of God that pricks at that thing and picks at that thing and pops the things that the enemy has got floating around and it just starts knocking those things out. Amen. A real encounter in the presence of God, not in the presence of a famous person, not in the presence of, you know, this this man manufactured experience that we're calling, you know, whatever. But in a real setting where God can just move and lives can be touched, when you see lives changing, changing, everybody say changing, we see lives changing, attitudes changing, people's faith increasing, that's a real move of God. A real move of God does not take one person and elevate them up to be like, you know, so much, but they, a real move of God changes lives that even the leadership will be laying prostrate on the floor. Amen. That they're laying in tears. There are times when you need to see a leader. You need to see, um, excuse me, you need to see the people that are up worshiping God and cultivating and doing. You need to see them laying prostrate on the floor and crying out in the presence of God as they worship God. I think the other thing that, that we need to understand is that worship is not and praise and all of that is not a Sunday activity. 
It's not a Saturday night activity. It's not a Tuesday night activity. It's not a, I got invited to this special occasion, so I'm going to go down here and praise God activity. Praising and worshiping God is something that we should be doing day in and day out. In everything, giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. To God be the glory. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord all my soul and all that is within me. So when you come together, when the saints come together, we shouldn't be coming together to worship. We should be coming together and continuing to worship because we've been living a life of worship. Uh, woo, thank you, Jesus. I feel the presence of God. We've been living a life of worship, living a life of consecration, living a life of, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Father, I thank you and I know that you're going to supply all of my needs, Lord. You're going to open up doors, Lord. You're faithful. You're great. You know, practice taking 30 minutes of your day and not asking God for anything, but just bragging on him and telling him how good he is. You know, I I have seven children. My wife and I have seven children, five sons, two boys, and I love every one of them so much. And I, I love to, I love to receive love from them. And when I give them something or I do something for them that they appreciate and they come on and come run up and thanks, Dad, and they give me a hug, I appreciate that. But when I'm just standing in the kitchen getting a drink of water and one of my children walks up behind me or walks up beside me and just takes a hold of me and just gives me a strong hug for no reason, that's like medicine. That does something to me as a father that they want to come and embrace me and love on me just because I'm their dad. How much more does the heavenly father who gave his only begotten son, hallelujah, who gave up everything to come down and become like us so that we can become like him when we just take time to just worship him, not because we're asking for something, not because he did something for us, but simply because we have found him to be faithful. We have found him to be merciful. We have found him to be everything we need in any moment that we find ourselves in, that we can just brag on him, Lord, you are everything I need, God. You are more than enough, hallelujah, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I could ask or think. Man, that blesses my heart. How much more do we need to glorify God and spend time worshiping Him? So those are the things that should be going on day in and day out, day in and day out. So when we come to church or we come to a worship night or we come, we're not going there to do something spiritual. We're already walking in it. We're already there so that when the Spirit of God begins to move, we're already connected to it. We're already flowing in it and we can be blessed and then we can turn and be a blessing. Amen. One of the greatest things that, that happens when we start letting God clean us up and we, we start letting God change us and we start letting God do in us what he wants to do. One of the greatest things that comes from that is that we're able then to turn and be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. I thank God. You know, I, I thank God when I have an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. And I'm thank God when he gives me a word for somebody or, he, you know, sometimes it's just a little text. How you doing? You're on my mind. I hope, pray you're doing all right. God bless you. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a big thing. You know, you don't have to reach out to somebody with a big, massive word from the Lord and, and all of that to be a blessing to somebody. Sometimes people will cross your mind and it's just for you to pray for them. Maybe text them. Maybe, you know, give them a phone. Call. How you doing? Are you on my mind this morning? That you don't know what that does. And as leaders, especially, we don't get those phone calls. I, I, it's rare that I'll get a phone call or a text message. Says, How are you doing? Just thinking about you. I don't get those. I get the come quick, come now. Oh, my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. So-and-so this and so-and-so that and this crisis and that crisis. And, and, and that's okay. I'm not complaining. Those happen when you're in ministry. That's all part of it. Amen. But I know how I appreciate it when somebody just randomly, hey, thought about you today. I hope you're doing all right. You've been a blessing or I, you know, whatever. It ain't even got to be about that. But it, it's just, it, it blesses. Be a blessing to somebody. Build somebody up. When somebody's thinking about you, because, you know, God could let folks forget about you. <laughs> and that's real. Amen. You, you think you being a blessing and God can let folks just forget about it. They ain't thinking about you. But when God lays you on somebody's heart, and they, they, you know, that's a blessing. Be a blessing. So when, when, when you get in a position where you can be a blessing to somebody, I hear people all the time, well, I'm going to be a blessing to you one day. And what they're talking about is one day I'm going to have enough money to buy you a car or buy you something. 
You can be a blessing long before you got two nickels to rub together to buy anybody a piece of gum. You can be a blessing to somebody just by smiling at them. You can be a blessing to somebody just simply by telling them God's got you. And I'm praying for you. And I believe the great, you know, the Bible says that we should all prophesy. We should all be prophesying to one another. Prophesying life. You know, there's a difference between a prophet and, 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 and prophecy and personal prophecy and stuff that goes on. You know, and that's, that's a whole other Bible study. But, you know, I'm talking about, he told us, he said, we should all prophesy. We should be encouraging. When I speak life over you. I speak increase over you. I speak you know, wholeness where you're broken. Amen. I, I, the Lord has been really just speaking to me about being whole where we're broken. I want to be whole in every area. Amen. As a father, I have desired to see my children whole in areas where I was broken. I've desired to see my children better in areas where I was not where I needed to be, or I didn't have what I needed to have. You know, I heard somebody say it, and I agree with it. I endeavored to be to my children, what, as a father, what I wish they had had. And I was really, I feel led to share this, I was really uh, laboring with that and really trying to make sure I was there for my children and not letting, because I, I went through a lot of stuff because of the absence of a father. And, and my mother, rest in peace, amen, she, she did a great job. And, you know, when, when I say these things, I'm not defaming her or disparaging anything she did. My mother raised me well, and I thank God for her. But I went through a lot not having a father in place in my life. I have a biological father, but he wasn't where he needed to be in my life, and he wasn't there for some crucial moments. But thank God there were other men in my life who were there at pivotal moments, and, and I can look back and see how God strategically placed them in my life. Amen. And that, again, is another testimony. But... I've endeavored to be to my children what I wish I had had. Amen. And, and when we begin to allow God to heal us, we can be to other people what we wish somebody had been to us. Amen. We can be that resource. Amen. We, God wants us to be a resource, not just, you know, a high five and a smile, but we need to desire to be a resource for God's people. Lord, put me in a position that I can not just bless financially, but that I can bless spiritually. I can bless with encouragement, that I can bless with a prayer. Amen. That I can bless somebody. Lord, equip me that I can be a resource in every area of this life where it's needed by your people. God has wants all of us to be a resource. My wife and I have told our children that for years. God wants you to be a resource. When you're coming up in this earth, God wants you to be a resource naturally and spiritually. A re Hallelujah. A resource for people. Amen. The people know I can call them. And if they don't have it, they know who does have it. And if they don't know, then they're going to pray and God's going to show them. I got confidence that I can call them and they're going to see about whatever. You want to get to that place. So I was endeavoring to be to my children what I wish I had had. And so I was really, really, you know, it got to the point where I love them, but it was really weighing on me heavy. And I was talking to one of my sons and, and, and I was talking about something serious and I said son I know these conversations are awkward sometimes and I ask these intrusive questions but I just don't want you to go through what I went through and he looked at me in that moment he said dad I'm never going to go through what you went through because I have an amazing father and I, I was speechless for a minute and I looked at him and I realized in that moment that just by existing in the place that God had put me as his father and being content to be right there and to stay right there through the thick and the thin and the hard and the easy. Amen. I had already been the difference I was trying to be. I had already become the difference. I'm not saying I was perfect, but I was sure better than, <laughs> than what I had had. Amen. So he said, I'm not going to go through what you went through because I have a father that's in place. Sometimes we are working so hard to be a blessing that we don't understand that we already are a blessing simply by being who we are. Amen. I, I can weep when I think about how people are lacking just the human connection, how they're lacking role models, how they're lacking people in their life to say to them, be encouraged. It's going to be all right. Amen. One of the most valuable people that God placed in my life. My mother prayed a scripture over me and I feel very strongly to share this. Encourage mothers out there that may be raising little boys and maybe raising sons. You can do it. But there's a scripture or even daughters, amen, there's a scripture that says, 
He will give you men for your life. And my mother would pray that over me. Often I would hear her praying for me and she would say, well, Father, your word declares that you will give me men for my life. And I declare over a CE that you will give him men for his life. And one of the most important men that God ever placed in my path. And I'm not saying this to flatter anybody, but the most important one of the one of the most important men that God placed in my life was Bishop Roy Tucker. I was 14, he was 21, and God just placed him in my path. And just through him being the great person and man of God that he is, my life was changed. My life was transformed. My, I, 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 I was rescued from some very serious things simply because he existed in my life. So I am going to encourage you that you may not think you're doing much of anything. You may not understand why God has you staked out the way you are. But I promise you, if you're serving God and you're a sincere before God, that you are in place to be a blessing to somebody, whether you realize it or not. Those sailors that were on that ship that Jonah got thrown off of, after he got in the water and the storm stopped, they stopped serving their gods and started serving the real God and making vows. That's in that first chapter, the 16th verse of, of Jonah. Amen. They turned to the real God because Jonah in his mess Ha! Hallelujah! Jonah in his mess, God still used him, and he was a resource for them to bring them to, to God, to bring them to the living God, amen? To bring them to the real, the realness of our God, amen? So wherever you are tonight, whatever you're going through, whatever you have faced in life, I promise you, God is going to finish everything, and he's going to get the glory out of your life. Hallelujah. He's going to get the glory out of my life. He's going to get the glory out of every one of us. That's the goal. Amen. The goal is not houses and land and millions of dollars in the bank. And then the children got to fight over it when you die. All those things are nice. Don't misunderstand me. A righteous man lives, uh, and the Bible says, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So those are, that's all things we should be doing. But in the end of it all, God wants to get the glory out of our life. Amen. God wants to get the glory out of your life. I want to encourage Minister Janet uh, Tucker, who I believe is watching this broadcast tonight. You are a bigger impact in this earth than you possibly realize. The prayer that you pray, the prayers that you pray early in the morning and the text messages and the phone calls that you make, sometimes just from your bed, resting your body is having a greater impact on this earth than you realize. Sometimes I don't know if you feel like, well, you know, I'm just doing what I can. But you're doing more than you realize. Be encouraged. Amen. Be encouraged. Praise God. Amen. This little song was on my heart. Amen. Before the Bible study. And I want to share it. If you know it, sing it with me. He who began a good work in you. Oh, he who began a good work in you. He's faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. Oh, he who began a good work in you. Me too. He who began a good work in you. faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, he who began this good work in you. He who began a good work in you. Oh, he's faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. You, 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 you. Started a work is faithful to complete it in you. He's faithful to complete it. We used to 
sing it like this. He's faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. I don't have to worry. No, I don't have to fret no more. No, I don't have to worry. No, I don't have to fret no more. It does not matter what the devil do. No, it don't even matter who he works through. Because he's faithful to complete it. Faithful to complete it. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. He who started this work is faithful to complete. Hallelujah. He started a work. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he started this work. Jesus started this work. Not me, not you. He started this work. Oh, Jesus did. Yes, he did. He started this work. Jesus started this work and he's faithful to complete it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you. I like that part. Say he's faithful to complete it. Jesus is faithful to complete it. Said I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret no more. No, I don't have to worry. No, I don't have to fret no more. Said it does not matter what the devil do. It don't even matter who he works through. Because he's faithful to complete it. Jesus is faithful to complete it. I know he's faithful to complete it. Yes, he's faithful. Yes, he is. Oh, yes. He who started a work is faithful to complete it in you, 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 you. you started this work oh yes Jesus started this work Jesus started this work and he's faithful to complete it in me and you amen amen hallelujah yeah I feel like shouting right now praise God hallelujah Jesus we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Ramo Kosha. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's your faithful. You're faithful to do what we need done. Hallelujah. You're faithful. You're faithful to do what we need done, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I'll never forget how you set me me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never said with me, said Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Hallelujah. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. Hallelujah, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Hallelujah, Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Thank you, Lord, Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. What 
what you've done for me Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought Hallelujah, brought me out Jesus, I'll never forget No, never Lord, I'll never forget how you brought me out Jesus, I'll never forget No, never Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. So good to us, Lord. So good. We celebrate you tonight, Lord. We thank you that you brought us out. You're bringing us out. Hallelujah. And it's for your glory, God. It's for your glory, not our glory, not our honor. It's to God be the glory. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God, sorry, be the glory. To God, be the glory for the things He has done. For with His blood, He has saved. With his power, he has raised me to God, be the glory for the things he has done. How many know he deserves all the glory and all the honor? Hallelujah. And all the praise. It all belongs to Jesus, to God. Be the glory to God. Be the glory to God. Be the glory for the things, hallelujah, he has done. His blood, He has raised me, and with His power, He has raised me to God. Be the glory for the things. the things he has done and is doing amen he who started this work Jesus you started this work you're gonna finish this work Lord you started this work I believe it I believe it I believe it Jesus you started this work and you're faithful to complete it in you and me God bless you tonight. I'm so thankful for this time that we've had together. Amen. Amen. I'm sitting in my office at work and I have a piano in my office and I take it with me everywhere. I've worked in this district. Every position I've taken, I'm like, I'm coming. I'll take the promotion, but I got to bring my piano. Amen. And ain't nobody ever gave me no trouble. People walk by my office. You got a piano in here? They say, what do you do with it? Well, I play it. Amen stressful moments and happy moments I will play my piano but that it's just so good that God gave me a, a job where I can be here and work hard but I can play and it doesn't bother nobody we'll have some church right here in the, in the office amen but I thank God for the opportunity and the honor to be with y'all tonight and we just ask you to be encouraged if you're watching this and you want to give into Mother Trucker Ministries amen there are several different ways that you can go to mothertruckerministries.org and push the donate button you can give that way and there is a uh, cash app and um, I believe it's MT Ministries dollar sign MT Ministries praise God and there's PayPal and I can't re 
would call that right now. If you want to mail a check in, amen, you can mail it to P.O. Box 773, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. If you need assistance or you need help tonight, you find yourself in a place needing some assistance or some guidance, you can call the ministry at 918-425-7771. Be sure and leave a detailed message and someone will get back with you, amen, and pray with you and see what God can can open up in doors. Amen. So God bless you. Be encouraged tonight. Know that Jesus loves you and we do too. Services are on Sunday mornings at 1130. Amen. Everyone is, everybody is somebody and everybody is welcome. God bless you. Mother would say at the end of every service, peace and love be multiplied to all and shake hands because you are friendly. God bless you. Love you.